So today we're getting started building a programming harness for an E67 computer. And I didn't see a whole lot of this on uh, YouTube or the internet as far as uh, complete stuff. So that's kind of why I'm making this video. Uh, I bought an HP Tuners MPVI-2, uh, which looks a lot like that. So got that going for me. But uh, I wanted to be able to build my own programming harness because if you buy one, they're a couple hundred bucks. And I think you can do probably for half of that if you wanted to. You could you could build one, maybe even less, um, depending on whether you buy the E67 uh, kind of dummy computer to go with it. So what I did is went down to uh, the local pick apart. I harvested this E67 computer out of a car. Um, the other things I harvested was the uh, port for that, so the OBD2 port. Uh, I kind of like this this type that have the uh, screw holes in it because when you mount that on your little programming box that you're going to build, it's easier to do it that way than have one that has to snap in, but that's up to you. And then the other things that I harvested were the blue and the gray uh, plugs for the computer. Um, when you go out there, you need to kind of know what you're looking for. And I'll put some links down in the description uh, for a place where you can go and see which computers you can harvest these types of plugs off of. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be an E67. But they need to look like this. When they say you needed the blue plug, it's just that cap inside that's blue. So the outside of these uh, plugs are all black. All right. When you get them, um, they will have a um, zip tie through here that holds the wires down. So cut the zip tie off. After that, you'll be able to pull the top shell off and it'll end up looking something like that. There's two clips at the back uh, here, one, one here and one on the other side. So you undo the clips, roll the thing forward and off it comes. Okay. Next thing you need to do is pull the uh, inside cap, either blue or gray, out of the plug. And to do that, you can see where this, this goes uh, all the way into the plug here. And it just snaps in, and it is held in by not much. Um, and I say that to say this. If you're really putting a lot of effort into getting this cap off, you're probably about to break something. So you just want to put something in the, the short side here, pull up slightly on it, and then go to the other side, pull up slightly on this side. If you have it in the right place, it won't take a whole lot of effort to get it out. So if you're really digging hard or pushing hard or anything like that, you're probably not doing it right. Okay, so take the blue one off and take the gray one off. Next thing you'll see when you get in there is uh, this. So you've got the inside of the plug with all of those pins sitting in there. And if you uh, need to deep in, which you will, I just went ahead and deep pinned everything because you really don't need all those wires hanging out. And all you're looking for is like, you know, five wires, I think it is, maybe a few more. But the rest of those are going to be a hindrance to you because if they're powered and they touch each other or something else with the stubs of the wire that you cut off, then you could fry your computer. So you don't want to do that. Depinning these a lot easier than I thought. Okay. So if you can see that there's two rows uh, separated by pieces of plastic. Okay. Um, and I, I say that there's really four rows of pins. So there's two here and two here. All right, so got that going for us. You don't need to use any kind of depinning tool to get these out. What you do is you pull it, the, the pin, slightly away from the plastic part. So if it was the bottom row of pins here, I would pull down toward uh, the bottom. And, and when I say the bottom, I mean this way. So down toward the bottom of the connector slightly while pushing on the wire from the back. And when you do that, um, I'll show you what it looks like here in just a second. But the, the pin really just comes right on out. So 
I'm going to put this on pause. I'm sorry I don't have a uh, uh, some kind of pedestal or something to put the phone on uh, so I could show you, but it, it's not real difficult. So here we go. All right, we're back looking at the same plug. So if I turn it on its side, what you will see is this pin is slightly extended. And to get it into that configuration, like I said, I just pulled it slightly away from the plastic middle uh, section. And when you do that, it releases um, the little clip that, uh, that holds your wire in. And if you push the wire from the back while you're doing that, you get that thing sticking out. And then really from there, all you have to do is you pull the thing out the front like that. All right, so you can deep in your entire plug Really no tools required except maybe something to cut the um, the zip tie that's around the bottom part here holding the wires in. So de-pin everything and have two bare plugs ready to go. Once you get the repinning all done, uh, sorry, so once you get the de-pinning done, it's time to start repinning. So uh, that's what has gone on here. I'm just gonna show you this, right, this website called Custom ECM Programming. Uh, up the top, you can see it says customecm.com, and the places you want to be looking are where it says bench harness. Okay, so bench harness pinouts and then DIY bench harness that's where I got all this information from. So, a uh, big shout out to them for giving us uh, El Cheapo's some good information. All right, so it goes through a whole bunch of different kinds of harnesses, etc. E38, we go down to E67. This is the one that we're concerned with. So what I do is I, um, once I cut off the connectors in the junkyard, I cut off the black one too. And then, like I said, I left plenty of leader wire coming out of it. So cut as far down the harness as you can. Uh, that'll just save you some wire and some headaches. Um, I pulled out the colors that I needed. Specifically, you can see it says uh, I need a yellow and a blue down here in the bottom. And then I need a pink, a red, and a brown. Do you have to wire them that way? No, you don't, but it just helps keep things straight. So that's what I did down here. You got your uh, blue and your yellow down the bottom right. And then in uh, pins four and right, uh, five on the, I'm sorry, five and six on the second row over, uh, you got your pink, which is uh, ignition, and red, which is constant voltage. And then a brown for um, ground over in pin eight, and that's on the third row over. So I did that. I put uh, good old zip ties back on, just like the factory had. And then the next thing will be sw uh, snap the shells back on top. Other things I procured, you can see from their website what you need. But I'll probably put some links to the stuff I used also. So got this project box. Uh, with a lid, got some switches, uh, drilled a hole in the top, put the two switches in. The switches are not momentary, they're, they're on-off type stuff. So, did that. Um, that's what they look like on the back side. And then I told you about the OBD2 port already, I got that. And also a power supply. And they have one listed that's 12 volt, 3 amps that you can buy from uh, Amazon for 14 or 15 bucks, something of that nature. I went through my wires of unknown origin and found one that, uh, that I think will work. So it's 12 volts, two and a half amps. That should be enough for sitting on the bench. And um, we'll see how it goes. All right, so here's the shells snapped back together. And one thing I did forget to tell you is make sure after you repin them, uh, to repin them, you push the wires, the connector and the wire through the back. Um, so if you harvest enough wires and you can get the right colors and you like making things color match to the diagram, then uh, they push through the back. There's a certain way they go in. You kind of got to fiddle with it until it pushes through. It'll snap in and then make sure you put your connector lock, which is the blue or the gray um, uh, pin lock there back in the um, in the connector all right so didn't want to didn't want to skip you on that one 
Next step in the process here is getting the box ready. Um, I used a little bit bigger box than they did, and I think I think that's fine for what I'm doing. All right, so I got my OB2 port here. I got uh, holes drills for drilled for wires there for the OBD2, and then I'm gonna make my power come in here. So power in, all the goobity gook that goes in here, um, programming device out to out to the uh, computer from here. You can see there's a knot tied in here, so that's for uh, stress in case you pull on that stuff. Next thing is to take all the wire in, strip them and tin them and get them ready to uh, solder together. And then you're gonna heat shrink all the, uh, the joints. So make sure you put your heat shrink tubing on your wire before you solder them together. So I'll show you what that looks like when I'm all done. I'll take this opportunity to show you a couple of tools that I really like that I use. Um, these are by Crescent. They're a pair of side cutters and they come and they're, they're kind of micro, they're small. Um, so they're for, good for getting in tight spots. Um, buy those, they're good. Crescent comes as a two pack. So you get the side cutters and you get a pair of really cool needle nose and then go hide them so nobody takes them and ruins the blades on them. Uh, for stripping the wires, I use vice grip. These seem to work really well and they've got adjustability for uh, tension. So that helps. And then uh, the other thing I use a lot is this Hakko soldering iron uh, or soldering iron, Bob. So uh, it's got a place to, you know, hold the, the tip there. Uh, it's got something to clean the tip off and it used to have a piece of uh, sponge there, but I have lost that somewhere, so I need to replace it. All right, soldering joints. Once they get done, twist them together, solder them in. And then you'll take your heat shrink, slide that down on top of it, and then apply heat to make the joint good. Here's where those side cutters really come in handy. So that joint's gonna have kind of an extra little doodad sticking off the end there. You can clip that, make it nice and flat. So that seems to work pretty good. Okay, let's move on. I guess before we get too far, uh, far down the road, I need to tell you that uh, after you have tinned your wires and soldered them together, you wanna to pull test them. So just grab each side of the wire, give it a little yank, make sure it's not gonna come apart easily uh, before you put the heat shrink on top of it. That'll save you some headaches later. After all that's done, the next thing we're gonna do is go to the website again and go to DIY Bench Harness, which will take you down to not only their instructions and everything they used, but the wiring diagram. All right, so we got that going for us. Uh, I will say this, I didn't use the Molex connector that this guy used. He reprograms a lot of different computers. I'm building this specifically for an E67. And uh, if you want to use the Molex, that's probably a great idea. I just didn't want to spend the extra money and time, even though it's a few dollars. I just don't have a reason. So that'll be what's next on the agenda. Here's a quick picture of the inside of the box. And then you can see I got the uh, wrapping done for the plugs. Okay, so now it's time to solder the rest off the top of the box. And that's off the same website. Just look at the link below the one you were looking at a while ago um, under the DIY stuff. So it's a bigger box than they probably used on the tutorial I saw, but it helped me because I could just tuck the wires all in there. So you got your box. Power supply runs over there. Here's the uh, wires that run to the two connectors for the computer. Those are the ones I harvested and repinned. Working on professional here, so you turn it on and the little red light comes on. And then when you go to ignition, it's an intermittent switch. So you press for ignition, and if you need to hold it for three seconds and let go, you just turn it on or off that way. Almost like your car. Here's the end of the road for the project, except for testing it out, which I'll uh, film when I do that. Um, I need to go back through and run the, uh, particularly the power pinouts to make sure that I'm getting power where I'm supposed to. Uh, but all the wires are tucked in the box. I, I used a bigger box than they did, but it made it a lot easier to wire it and it'll suffice for my needs. 
I went ahead and flipped the OBD2 port up so the MPVI2 from HP Tuners just goes in like that. And then there'll be a computer cord running off of it, I'm sure. There's my cords going down to the uh, connectors for the E67. And then uh, my power supply cord runs out the back. Uh, when you turn it uh, on, so the only thing I don't like is when you turn the switches down, it's the on position, but it works. Man, I can't get that light out of my camera view there. Uh, let me see something here. All right, that's better. So down goes to the on position. I have a mark there. And then uh, when you want ignition, because it's wired right, it's got an intermittent. So you turn the ignition on, you let go, it goes off. Uh, I will say that you need to make sure you get the right OBD2 port or you'll be repinning that. There's some videos on YouTube that'll show you how to do it. And then um, last but not least, if you'd just rather buy an OBD2 port and wire it yourself, I would get the one from Michigan Motorsports. I saw it on Amazon, it's about nine bucks. So it comes with a blank OBD2 and all the pins and you just crimp the pins and put it in and get whatever you want. This is the second try uh, on my uh, bench harness here. I proved it worked right on the one, uh, the computer that I rated from a Saturn Ion. It read that one. So now I've got it uh, reading the LS computer that I kind of bought as a standalone uh, from a guy. So you can see I'm holding the ignition key down so it's got power. I think I can actually let it go. I did on the other one, it read just fine. But um, anywho, uh, got the power on, got the ignition on, and it's in here doing its thing. I'll let you see what it says on the top. Like I said, you can see that one says Saturn Ion. And it should just take a few minutes to read and see what's up. And then uh, I'll show you that. So after I read it and uh, saved the file, it came up as a LS3 generic crate motor. Had a VIN associated with all that stuff. And you can see that, you know, once you get it downloaded and saved, some of these options come up across the top. So we'll say that uh, it's definitely working. You know, you go in and look at the OS, it saves all that stuff for you. So that's fantastic. Uh, at least it's a start. Um, I know I didn't tell you exactly how to build this thing, but I showed you where to go to do it. And no one is half the battle sometimes. Things I would do different, probably not much anything. Um, I did replace the, um, uh, the OBD2 port. I bought one from uh, Michigan Motorsports. I'll try to remember to leave a link to that. Uh, but just the one I had, I don't know. I, I, I felt the pinouts weren't doing really good. They, I had to repin it and some of them were funky. So this just got me a new one. Uh, I like the bigger box, you know, having everything all wrapped up. Uh, makes it easier to mess with, so I like that part of it. The power supply works great. It worked great on a Windows 7 computer, so you don't need the latest, greatest Windows or anything. And I know some of the more experienced people will tell you, you know, you can use different things. I think you can use uh, Microsoft Surface and some of that st type of stuff. But at least you, you, this gets you started on a bench harness for an E67 and being able to uh, pull your tune off of it and start looking at it and fiddling with it. All right, good luck. Bye.